My favorite is a thing called Testadero, which is a multiple sclerosis drug, which was first discovered in the 17th century in France as a mold retardant. Who knew? <laughs> and now does about $3 billion a year. So to do repositioning is actually easy, but to do it well, as we will see, is pretty, pretty hard. And that's, uh, if this field ever becomes interesting to you, um, realize that one can cut corners, but that doesn't always benefit, right? <laughs> so whatever the starting point AI is to do repositioning, the key idea is that it should do benefit and risk equally well. Remember that in healthcare, when one is developing a drug, the drug has to meet two criteria. Is it beneficial? And what risks does it cause? It's always about that BR ratio. The FDA looks to that all the time. So if I'm going to use any kind of technology, be it AI or something else, we'll talk about this, to reposition a drug, because ultimately that will be very powerful for COVID, if it's AI again or something else, it should do both equally well. You'll see an example where that fails, and that's what distinguishes between good versus bad. Does the approach address this? Now, let's talk about the business of repositioning. I gave you some multi-billion dollar examples, but let's make it absolutely real, because if you think about this as a career, I want to show you some concrete examples of the money involved. So at BioVista, we examined all the drugs sold by the top 12 pharmaceutical companies in this country. And we asked the question, how many of your drugs are actually repositioned? They weren't developed for the current use. They were originally developed for something completely different. Turns out that about a quarter of the entire drug pipeline of the top pharmaceutical companies started life as something completely different. That is an enormous contribution to the tune of $130 billion to the top line per year. Remember, this conference is, this webinar is sponsored by the School of Business Administration. So even though most of us are geeks here, we must connect this to the money. So the connection is absolutely tremendous. And just to give another, another example that makes this even more visible and powerful, this is the example of a monoclonal antibody, which is a type of drug against cancer, that GlaxoSmithKline outlicensed to Novartis, these are two huge pharmaceutical companies. The first use was for cancer for a billion dollars. So Novartis paid a billion dollars to get the rights to this drug for cancer. And they figured out that it works in multiple sclerosis, cancer multiple sclerosis, rather different. And they paid another billion dollars for those new uses. That's why this field is so, so good to be in. It's also so efficient and that much better for patients, obviously. And in fact, just to take this even more to those of you that will ultimately pursue careers, and it does happen from the science and the technology to the business and then to the patenting and the intellectual property, because the currency of the pharmaceutical industry is who owns the patents at the end of the day. This is what happens if you do not find new uses for your existing drugs. Somebody else might. And if they find the new uses to your drugs and they get the patents, they block you from using your own drug in the new indication, right? These are ideas that uh, are incredibly important when we put the holistic context of this field together. We've talked about the business. Let's go into some, um, some tech. So most drug repositioning is of the expected type. Uh, either it is because it's an explicit relationship. I find that this drug works in this disease because it targets this molecular target, this particular protein. This protein is also involved in this other disease, so therefore this drug will work in this other disease. These are explicit relationships. There are some that are implicit that are slightly more complicated. So if A upregulates B and B downregulates C, then A must downregulate uh, or, or uh, must downregulate C. There's a typo there in my, in my slide because of that implicit inferred relationship. And then there is the third order, which are the truly non-obvious ones. You have to integrate a large amount of information, sometimes conflicting, and resolve those conflicts in order to establish something that is non-obvious but probable or likely. 
but most repositionings of the first two types, explicit or implicit, the reason is because it is much easier to do. Let's see some examples. To do repositioning is easy. Um, it varies from the thing that most people do, which is called phenotypic screening, which means that I take the drug and I have a whole bunch of cell lines growing in Petri dishes, and then I test it in each and every one of those. And maybe I have 60 or 70 of those. And I do this in brute force, actually very small degree of brute force, but it is the phenotype. It's the actual biology that is telling me. I test it. And then if it's not done in cell lines, maybe I have 10 animal models, one next to the other, and I test them. Or maybe I do pathway hopping, which means that I know these molecular pathways look similar, so at their intersections, this pathway leads to cancer, this pathway leads to multiple sclerosis. Bob's my uncle, as they say in Britain, right? Or there is a very interesting one, which is the adverse event mapping. So what these guys do is they look at the labels of the drugs, and if they find side effects that are the same for two completely different drugs, the assumption is that these two completely different drugs, hey, they cause the same side effects, maybe they can work in each other's disease. That's called adverse event matching. And then there is array screening. So these people look at the upregulation or downregulation of genes in particular diseases, and then they look to find drugs that have the opposite effect. So if this disease has this gene upregulated, I'm going to search all drugs for the effect of downregulating the same gene, no matter what the drug is doing, right? Sounds extremely sensible, and it is, and it's easy, and it's necessary, and we all do it because it's the first level. But um, there is a problem with that, and it's that's the single data source. And I'm going to give you an example of an anti-epileptic drug, a very famous example, called topiramate. So topiramate is prescribed for epilepsy, different forms of epilepsy. And this group, extremely good group, used machine learning and this up-down regulation of microarrays and genes and figured out that this anti-epileptic drug would work against Crohn's disease, irritable bowel syndrome. Very different. And then they even went ahead and validated it in animal models. It even works in the experiment. Tremendous. The Wall Street Journal wrote about this because, my God, irritable bowel disease? Yeah, you want a solution to that. There is a problem, though, and that is that on the label of the drug itself, the known side effects of this anti-epileptic drug are kidney stones and diarrhea. If there are any people in the audience with a medical background, the red light should be flashing at this point in time. So let me make it crystal clear. In Crohn's disease, the biggest complications are kidney stones and diarrhea. What this approach says is, I found this drug to put in this condition, but the side effects of this drug are the condition. You cannot reposition a drug in a disease that is the actual side effect of the drug. This was entirely a contribution of the method used. It ignored everything else. Can't do that. That's cutting a corner. Even though you demonstrated it in an animal model, an animal model is not nearly reflective of the human condition, right? You all know that. Okay, so time to flip the switch a little bit. I've talked about repositioning. Now I need to switch to AI, and then I'll come to COVID. So a little bit about my, my company. We are a company in the space of AI and healthcare. In fact, we like to call it augmented intelligence, not artificial intelligence. Um, uh, we are recognized all over the work for all over the world for the type of work that we've done and we continue to do. We actually invest in AI doctrines themselves and how they apply. And we've enjoyed the relationship with multiple clients uh, from Hewlett Packard to point of care hospitals where we've deployed the AI uh, for patient support and all sorts of pharmaceutical companies patient advocacy groups, and so on. We're developing our own drugs as well. You will see that later on. We've made a ton of mistakes in the space. <laughs> We've made an absolutely huge number of mistakes in the space, how to cut a corner and what that means and why not to do it. And we've also learned the good, the bad, and the ugly. And that's what I'm trying to, uh, to share with you. So enough about us. Um, and in COVID, we have deployed our technology since about March when it became obvious that um, vaccines, even back then, would be wonderful when they show up. But just like with flu, there will be other complications, 
and I'll talk about that, that will limit the vaccines uh, and we will need something else to complement the vaccines. And so uh, we have been very, very active in the space. We're not obviously the only ones deploying AI to reposition drugs to get to complications of COVID as quickly and as fast as possible. And one of the things that we did was try to quantify the problem. Um, we let our AI try to help us understand how big is the data problem? What number of individual data points do we need to prosecute in COVID? And if we do a simple breakdown of how many genes do we need to explore? How many pathways? How many post-translation modifications? How many drugs and bioactives and a whole bunch of other things? Then um, we estimate that only 10% of the data has been processed, more or less by everybody, certainly by us. But if we aggregate together um, what we can see and what is visible, it's a very small percentage to date. And why is that? The reason why COVID is so data hard is because of what are now understood and called long haul complications, because it's simply affecting and leaving a trail of devastation behind it in every organ system. So you're not talking about just a monodimensional issue. And when we integrated all of this, to this point in time, we feel that uh, this 10% number, very few people have even attempted to try to quantify that and we are likely wrong by something, but it simply illustrates the point that this is a very data hard problem, which means it will require completely new doctrines of data management, let alone AI to handle it. So we absolutely need AI, but not all AIs are created equal. And I will commit the cardinal sin of for the purposes of academic freedom in a webinar that is populated by a lot of friends of machine learning dare to say that machine learning may not be the best tool for the job <laughs> even though we at Biovista use a ton of machine learning and I will attempt to explain myself simply put to a hammer everything is a nail we're not talking about nails and therefore we can't use the hammer nails will be a very small part of it so um, hopefully you will allow me to try to, um, to share some more. Can machine learning even apply to key COVID questions? Let me be absolute in the question. Can it apply? Can it even apply? So um, let's think about machine learning. And machine learning has beaten the chess champions, beaten the card players, is emerging as pretty powerful in car navigation. Obviously, we saw a beautiful talk before about reading MRIs and scans, right? Let's think about this slightly differently. If you have many moves, but few elements to move, like when you're playing chess, lots of moves, but few pieces. When you're playing cards, machine learning is fantastic. If you have few moves, but many elements to move, so a car can go front, back, left, right, accelerate, decelerate, some combination, few moves, but everything around the car, a bit of a problem, equivalent to when you're reading an MRI or a scan. But we have to look at each other and agree how to use language. ML does not predict anything. It doesn't actually predict, even though the ML community uses the word prediction all the time. It's simply matching and classifying against known scenarios. That's not a prediction. It needs training sets or known patterns or a predetermined rule that it can apply to learn, supervise, and supervise. But at the end of the day, it will arrive at a matching of what it sees against what you've shown it. All of this is fantastic. We do the same. This applies to what are known as closed questions, where the answer is pre-known. It does not apply to open questions, where you have no idea what the training set would even look like. So all of this was more or less understood, and then COVID-19 arrived and blew up the whole area, right? It was blown up before with things like Alzheimer's, but COVID-19 made it a lot more um, obvious. So you need the right tool for the job. Here is the way that we think of machine learning. We use this technique as well, but I'll give you some more. Machine learning extracts what's already there. Here is a bucket of Lego. I dump it on the floor. The machine learning in the form of a sensor, a camera, and then the software after 100 buckets will tell me how many bricks, what colors, and maybe there's a pattern on the floor. And then by the time the hundredth and one bucket dumps, it will be able to give me a matching and a probability of what that would look like. 
until and unless my little 10 year old son puts his shoe in the bucket. And when he puts his shoe in the bucket and dumps it on the floor, there goes my machine learning. I have to train it with Lego plus a shoe. So then we arrive at this artificial general intelligence model where you have to pack a lot of these and all the variations. Where does it begin? Where does it end? The answer isn't already there. Machine learning is a hammer looking for a nail. We have to be realistic about that. Here's a use case. Uh, this is work that we did in collaboration with FDA and a big health insurance company. And the problem was this. If you take a statin, it increases your risk of diabetes. But what are the risk factors? If you come to the game here, to the play with asthma, and your doctor says, oh, your, your triglycerides or whatever, I need to put you on, uh, on a statin, but the doctor didn't care about the asthma. Does the fact that you have asthma increase your risk of diabetes if they give you the statin? That's the problem statement. That's the problem the FDA had. They know that statins increase the risk of diabetes, but they needed the risk factors. They have every machine learning known to humankind. Clalit, which you'll see the health insurer, has every AI, every statistics, every machine learning known to humankind. They could not find it. Why? Let's see. So um, it ended up, I'll go straight to the problem, to the answer rather, that the problem is a bad thyroid. If you have hypothyroidism, that more or less guarantees that if you're given a statin, you get diabetes. So this is a $14 test. Clalit, the health insurer, paid, found out that it was paying $100 million a year to treat patients for adult onset diabetes, and all they had to do was get out of the statin rigmarole, change the statin. But it was not part of the typical treatment pathway to think about it. Wasn't, it wasn't in the consciousness. So um, let's go back. How would you train an ML to even do this? So you'd have to train it on three things, statins, diabetes, and risk factors, right? So let's talk about statins. There are seven options for statins. So you'd have to train it on seven statins. Diabetes, three versions, three versions of the diabetes. Risk factors, the FDA recognizes over 13,000 distinct, unique clinical outcomes that are risk factors, right? So we're beginning to see the problem, right? So not only do you have to do the seven statins, the three versions of diabetes, and the 13,000 risk factors, which is uh, 273,000 combinations of known starting points, but then for these 273,000 starting points, everything known underneath them, it is utopia to think, I don't care how big your computer is, to think that this can be done or is realistic. Uh, deference to the Google colleagues later on, right? It is extremely difficult to even begin to process how to code this. Not that it couldn't be done, but you get the point. So in addition to this problem of the actual coding, who's going to decide what the training sets even look like? You're going to have to have the diabetes expert and so on and so forth. What data will you use? How long will this take? Um, not easy. So we need a different AI doctrine. And this is what we bumped up against it by this and decided that we needed something else. We've been doing this for over 10 years, 15 years, in fact, developing this particular class of AI that we call machine building. Machine learning, we know what it does. Take the Lego, count the pieces. Uh, well, imagine taking the Lego pieces and building something. Imagine the red brick being everything you know about one G. Everything you know about the red, the blue one, one other G. Imagine you take these bricks and just like in your childhood or your adult life, I hope you do, we do at home all the time, you build Legos, you build structures, and then you say this plus this plus this actually makes sense as a bridge, right, as a scenario. This allows us to predict an outcome, not to match, and then to test whether it worked. This is prediction versus matching. This is the power of building from the existing data all possible scenarios so that you find something that is unexpected, not explicit, not implicit, not inferred, true unexpected. That's what we've been doing. Um, the way it works is the way a lot of these systems work. So I'm not going to bore you with this, but we have 52 million individual bricks to give you an example. And we recombine that in every which way they can be recombined. We have huge compute behind us, but that's neither here nor there. Uh, the data sets, I often, often laugh because I hear these people telling me, well, I have 200 data sets and you only have uh, 
um, 30 sources, and like there are hundreds of sources, but most of them are redundant. You see them this year, but you don't see them in the next year. So we've spent a lot of time figuring out what the really good data sources are from year to year. And remember that are consistent. We're not we're not finding the answers in those data sources, right? It's from here, it's where we build the bricks. And then we do our thing, and we have generated this database called Clinical Outcome Search Space, which is an all versus all. It's all drugs versus all mechanisms, all clinical outcomes, all pathways, all animal models. It's an absolutely enormous, enormous effort, project project. So what actually happened with FDA is they set the problem statement, we ran the AI, we predicted hypothyroidism, and then in a couple of weeks, uh, we proposed the numerator and denominator of the relative risk calculation. Clanit ran this in lots and lots of electronic health records. This ended up being what is now known as a digital twin virtual trial study and ended up in a very good paper in diabetes care. Um, I need to flip um, the, the switch now. We went from risk to uh, benefit. Let's talk about the use of AI in figuring out a new use. And so multiple sclerosis was an area. Everybody thinks that multiple sclerosis is a disease of the immune system, uh, but the trouble is that the drugs developed there, therein cause terrible side effects. So at Bivista, we wanted drugs against multiple sclerosis that will think of multiple sclerosis not as an autoimmune disease. So the AI did its magic brick thing, not pretty magical, but pretty huge, and said there's a different mechanism and that's mitochondrial dysfunction. And then we transpose the definition of disease from autoimmune to mitochondrial dysfunction, and we reposition drugs not to modulate the immune system, which is what everybody else is doing, but to modulate mitochondrial dysfunction. And we found the molecular target, a thing called superoxide dismutase, and we ran drugs that would improve the function in the mitochondria of superoxide dismutase. And we tested those in the animal models. We didn't test 10,000 drugs, we tested two. They both worked. The whole thing took 100 days from nothing to the result of the animal model. That's how powerful this thing is. I'm not gonna bore you with an experiment that goes even more deeply into all of this. I'm sensitive to, uh, to time, but the bottom line is that even the testing of this new doctrine of AI that is not machine learning, machine building needs to be tested in a completely different way. So the way that we came up to test it, which was extremely rigorous and difficult to carry out, was that we took the data set, in this case PubMed, and not only did we remove data from a certain period of time going forward, so we removed data from 2005 to today, we, right, in order to see in the back from, from past history whether we could see what is happening today. Not only did we do that, but from the remaining historical data, we removed competing data. Nobody has ever done that. Not only do you time slice, but you remove data that could pollute, that could bias your answer. Only then can you be really testing your AI. And we found that when we do this, we actually predict 70% or better of the clinical outcome reported for the first time at the big conferences in the space three to five years before first report. That's how powerful this thing is, and this approach, this doctrine is. So why are we optimistic? Yes, only 10% for COVID. Let me wrap all of this together. Um, but in this time frame, we and others have come up with approaches that are now beginning to bear fruit and give us optimism that whatever the vaccines do, we will be able to tackle the long fall sequela and complications. This translates to speeding up by two to four years at least. I'm gonna summarize. Done well, repositioning is an amazing platform. It's actually done by, by everyone, uh, but it's not always done well. And hopefully I've given you ideas of what's good and what's not good. COVID-19 is a massive challenge because it's so data heavy because it affects everything. But at the end of the day, we can only do this with AI as we all agree, but not all AIs or not all techniques are appropriate. We had to invent a new technique to attack this. Machine learning is fantastic. We use it as well, but I challenge all of us to think whether a hammer, a nail. Thank you very much.
open to any questions if you have them. Uh, I have one. I have one question about the uh, the MS and the mitochondrial dysfunction. Um, if in in those MS uh, susceptible patients, do they have other uh, disorders that that are dependent on mitochondria, or is that something that maybe you could look for or ask? Yeah, Randy, you and you asked that uh, before the same theme question. Absolutely. So. Um, we have found that the mitochondrial dysfunction event isn't just relevant for um, MS, but it's also relevant for Friedrich's ataxia and MELAS. And there's a whole class of diseases of mitochondrial origin. And this is what is happening. Yep. Fascinating. Yeah. There's a question in the chat as well. Oh. Um, if you can see that or I could read it out loud. I, I, uh, uh, okay. I. Do you think the FDA reg process save, saves lives on net? Uh, does the reg save, save lives or does it take so long or not getting it? All right. So what a powerful question and a tough one. Um, and to the degree that I am fully unqualified to answer it, I will take a stab at it. I think FDA has got a very difficult job. It has to protect all of us and that's its remit. And it has to take the data that are provided to it by um, efforts that range in quality and try to make sense of it. So it has come up with a system that works the way that it works, but can it work better? Uh, first of all, that's a theoretical question. Of course, anything can work better. Can the FDA system of approval work better? Of course, they confess and agree that themselves, but um, it is very difficult to design a system that will work better across the board, simply because not all diseases, not all issues are the same. And what the discussion, the real discussion now is, is how do we parse the different scenarios so that we can develop an approval process that is better tailored to each scenario as opposed to everything fits everything. I hope that makes sense. I hate to ask this, but um, for the for COVID, would would um targeting each of would it be possible to target each facet of of the COVID infection? Yes. And put it together. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Uh, and we're doing that, and we're going after the individual complications. So, for example, the microthromboembolisms, and so on and so forth. Yeah. Uh, and I see. I don't know if I um. Um, I have one more question, but it's up to you if you want me to answer it. How did you decide what data in PubMed was biased? So as to cut it off very quickly, we cut off data on all drugs that were similar to the drugs that we were testing. And then we cut off all data that were using the same mechanism of action, no matter what the drug was. So that made it super difficult if you think about it. We, we biased, the, we, we designed the test to make it as difficult for the system as possible. So it could not see the drugs themselves. It could not see similar drugs, number two. And third, it could not see similar mechanisms of action. Ergo, zero bias. That's what made it powerful. Okay, I don't want to abuse the privilege. Okay, uh, yeah, since um, there are no further questions, we'll um, uh, end the session and thank all of the speakers for outstanding talks and uh, a lot of uh, intellectual things to think about here with. Um, you know, how we're going to uh, digest all this information. So um, with that, I'll turn it over to the uh, uh, panel discussion. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Randy. Thank you for managing that session. Uh, wonderful presentation for all three speakers. And so uh, we move on to the uh, next session, which is sort of the uh, informal.